thank you so much for everything and thank you for being here. Today's message is, it is dark, but it makes sense. It is dark, but it makes sense. Let's pray. Lord, I pray, convict us, convince us, conform us to the image of Christ. It will be arrogant for me to tell you how I leave the office of strategy to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's begin at Genesis 8. We're reading Genesis 8. Um, if I was to swear an affidavit to change my name, it would be Jackson Genesis Sire. You know, I, I like the book of Genesis. Verse 1 says, And God remembered Noah and all the animals and all the cattle and all that were with him were in the ark. And he caused a wind to blow upon the earth and the waters assuaged. We will go on to verse 4, 2, 3, and 4, but for now let's just unpack verse 1. When you take time to read chapter 7 of Genesis, when Moses describes what the impact and the extent of the flood look like, it gives the description of 40 days of relentless rain. The waters rising above the peaks of the highest mountain and exceeding them by several cubits. So it was dark outside, but also remember the ark which we are about to look at was made with three stories. So the lower story occupants were in darkness. And anyway, in the midst of rain, you don't open windows. So picture with me, Noah is in this dark space. It's dark outside, it is dark inside. That's why I'm saying it is dark. But I'm also about to demonstrate it makes sense. And I'm speaking to somebody who's going and trying to make some sense out of a dark situation they're going through right now. Let me read the verse again so that you don't miss something. And God remembered Noah and those that were with him and the animals and the cattle that were with him were in the ark. Now, after all I have described about the rain, when you now continue reading verse 1 of Genesis 8, you begin understanding it differently. And it caused a wind to blow on the earth. You'd understand this is not a gentle wind. This is not some nice coastal breeze. There are no human beings outside. There are no at least living things outside. And with that amount of water, the wind we are looking at is tornado strength because it has to rush the water back into, um, into its position so that the land can be dry. So this is not a gentle wind. This is ferocious wind. And so when you read it that way, it seems to be a contradiction. God remembered me, and why am I suddenly caught in this wind? God remembered me, and why am I this broke? Why is my marriage going through these upheavals? Why am I passed for that interview? Why am I not seeming to progress? God remembered me? Why am I experiencing all these winds? It doesn't seem to make sense. And I agree, humanly speaking, it doesn't. But the verse says, God remember those who are in the ark. Let's, let's, let's re-examine this ark business a little bit more. Let's just go where it's, God has told us how it was made. At Genesis 6, I'm reading verse 14. From Genesis 6, from verse 14, Moses describing to us the architecture of the ark. He says this. 
And God said to Noah, make thee an what? Ark of gopher wood. And thou shalt pitch it with pitch within and without. Verse 15, and this is the fashion that thou will make it. It shall be 300 cubits long and 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits height. And thou shalt set a window above and complete it in one cubit. And you shall put a door on the side with first and second stories. That's how it's described. Now let's zoom in a little bit more. When you read verse 13, I didn't read it, but when you read verse 13, God says there's going to be a flood. He repeats after he's given Moses the instruction on what to do, how to build the ark. He says, for I bring a flood of waters. So please notice with me, God says there's going to be a flood and he tells Noah to build a boat. But let's look at the ark a little bit closer. In terms of dimensions, when you're making a sea vessel, there needs to be the proportion of how long it is and how wide it is and how high it, how high it is, needs to be within a certain range for you to create a vehicle that can be able to do well on the sea. If it is too short and too tall, it will topple over. If it is too wide and too, it will hobble. And when you read the dimensions and the, 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 the marine guys who've done the measurements of the, of the ark and have tested it tell you these dimensions are for a proper sea vessel. Which for, for those who are looking for evidence of inspiration, that is one of them. Like how, how would a farmer like Noah know how to build a boat of those proportions in proper way? That's good news. But then there's something more to this. I'm more interested in what the ark does not have rather than what it has. You notice we're told its height, we're told its length, we're told it's everything. But when you look carefully, the ark lacks two important things that are there on any ship. Number one, it does not have an engine or a sail. In the old days, they used to put this tall pole with a big piece of cloth so that it would capture wind and that's what used to be used for propulsion or they would have oars that people could be able to steer. The ark does not have any of those. It does not have a means to propel it. It does not have oars. It does not have a sail. It lacks that completely. Number two, the ark does not have a steering. When you see any modern ship or even old ship, there was a form of ability to steer so that we can be able to determine whether the ship will turn right or left or keep going forward or stall. The ark does not have that. Its dimensions are the dimensions of a ship. They make perfect sense. It'll float. But it does not have noise in this box. He's not able to move it faster. He's not able to change its direction. It seems a bad idea until now when you begin looking at Genesis 8, it begins making sense. Remember, we've established that the winds that we are talking about in Genesis 8 are not some gentle, nice, um, breezy winds. They are tornado strength. So imagine with me, imagine with me, if the ark had a sail, the wind would be trapped in the sail, but because the wind is stronger than the sail, what it would do is it would capsize the ship. For those who come from the islands like Mvangano or Rusinga, you understand what I'm saying. When you are, afternoon boat rides are a disaster. Um, the, 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 the lake takes a personality of its own. And some of those waves are ferocious, both in height and intensity. And you notice something with the expert riders. What they do is when the waves become too stormy, they switch off the boat. It was counterintuitive. But the reason they do that is 
When the boat's engine has been switched off, the boat becomes like a piece of log. It is not struggling against the elements. It is being carried up and down. And now the thing which would have destroyed it, in other words, if the, if the pilot of the boat would be trying to sail against the waves, he would go right into it. But by switching it off, by giving up the ability to steer, it ensures he survives. Christianity is, in very many regards, a religion of paradox. For us to gain, we give. For us to live, we die. For us to get to the next level of victory, we surrender. And this paradox of Christianity is very baffling to people. But I see it right here in the ark. God remembers Noah. Ladies and gentlemen, may I suggest to us that this remembering of Noah did not begin in the storm, but it began way before the storm. There's a concept called divine denials. There are things God in advance sees, and he allows that we experience some level of denial now, which as human beings is very frustrating. I missed getting an A minus by a mark. And boy, it was frustrating. But now as I have grown older, I definitely bow down my head and say, God, thank you. He has over the journey of life revealed to me things about me, which had I gotten the grades that I thought I should, it would be difficult to save me. I probably wouldn't be where I am now. Divine denials. Divine denial knew the strength of the winds coming. The divine denials knew the intensity of the floods coming. And divine denial knew that though naturally it would seem like a good idea to have a sail and to have a steering, having those two things would have ensured the ark capsizes rather than leaves through. God remembers Noah, not just during the storm, he thinks of Noah way before the storm. He tells him a flood is coming and then he turns around and tells him make a boat. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says the rain went for 40 days and for 40 nights. It did not go for 41 days, it did not go for 45 days. Why? Because it was God who had given the instructions of both dimension and materials that the ark should be built with. So he knew what this boat can take. He knew if I kept pounding this thing with rain for 200 days, the pitch will give way, the wood will begin decomposing. I know what I have instructed that boat to be made by. I knew it was the right vessel for this, but I will limit what amount of rain can come upon it. God remembered Noah, not just during the storm, but way before the onset of the storm. And the process of him being remembered includes the idea of divine denials. I slow down there so that you may begin appreciating divine denials. You, you really wanted to marry him or her. And, and, and God clearly kept blocking your way. And now, eight years into your happy marriage, you turn around and look at him and her, and you're thinking like, what was I thinking? You really wanted to invest in that thing because you're in a hurry to get rich, and God just kept blocking you from getting that money. And now you look back and you clearly can tell, had I invested in that thing, it would have gone awash. Divine denials. But, 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 but before we all go, hey, amen and everything, when we are experiencing divine denials, it is deeply frustrating. It is because that is as far as we can see. Ellen White puts it beautifully. God leads us in a way which if we saw as he sees, we would allow him to lead us as he leads. You see, if you were to explain to a child the science of immunology, before they can accept to be vaccinated, no child under the sun would be vaccinated. Because of one reason, they can't understand. 
When you tell them about T cytotoxic cells and, and, and T memory cells and, and B cells and immune trigger, and I know by now I've lost half of you, they cannot, as a three-year-old, grasp that idea. Yet it does not negate the idea that they still need to be vaccinated. Similarly, at times, God is not able to explain to us everything about his operations because he exists in a dimension completely different from ours. He has a view that is altogether different from ours and if he had to explain everything for us to get along or for us to tag along, we would never get anything done. But remember, remember, we know his character. We know his character even when his actions are not clear. It is dark, but it makes sense because of divine denials. Still keep on examining that wind. It turns out that these winds that are rocking my boat, internally that's how I think and I feel, because I'm in this closed space, externally those winds are creating a new terrain. You didn't get me. When Noah is inside the ark, he is not able to open it at that time. All him he knows, all he experiences, if you asked Mrs. Noah or Shem or Ham or Japheth or their wives, what were they experiencing in that time? All them they know is, hey, the boat was coming across very heavy winds. That's their experience as told from inside the ark. But if you step outside of the ark and realize what God is using the winds for, you begin understanding, ah, whereas the perspective from inside the ark is genuine, it is not complete. Yes, it is true, my, my boat is rocking, it is true, it is, I can feel it, I can tell, it is true, but it is not a complete picture. Because this wind that is tossing me in the boat is God's tool outside the boat. And you know what he's using the wind to? The Bible says in 8 verse 1, and the waters are switched. Which means they both stopped. Continuing now to read verse 2. It says under the Genesis 8 from, from verse 2, it says, and the fountains of the deep uh, were closed and the windows of heaven were stayed and the water and the rain was stopped and the waters continued to recede. So in other words, these things that I'm feeling inside the boat that are very uncomfortable and unexplainable in God's hands. They are the tools he is using to create a new terrain outside of the boat. So that 150 days after this start, Noah will step out of the boat into a new terrain for him. And you know what God used to create those terrain? The very things that he felt were a discomfort. The songwriter says, what if your blessings comes through raindrops? What if the trials of this time are just but a blessing in disguise? There's, there, there, there's a lot of dead material outside of the ark. There are humans, there's animals, there's, there's trees. The winds are important to bury all of that material up. But inside the ark, I can't feel it. But I can trust God as a divine orchestrator. That he will go behind the picture and orchestrate things. God blows the winds. God stops the water. Then in verse 4, he does something powerful. Genesis 8 verse 4. And after 150 days, the boat rested on the tops of the Mount of Ararat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know I'm an Adventist preacher. I cannot escape the temptation to remind you the mountain is made of a rock. The boat in the midst of all this is not just going to be left to float around aimlessly. God has some work to still accomplish, but he gives his people some breathing room. He brings the boat to the tops of some solid rock and rests it there while he's completing the rest of his work. Paul would perhaps look back at this when he reminds us in 
Corinthians that no temptation will come upon us but that which is common unto all men. And God is faithful, who will not permit you to be tempted beyond what you can be able to stand. Allow me to digress there for a minute. No, I is told to make a boat. God does not send fire. He knows he's been told to make a boat and God is true. He sends water. Because boats are designed to handle water. He's not unfaithful. He didn't tell him to make a, a boat and then sends savages with axes. No. God tells him make a boat because he knows there's going to be water. God will not permit you to be tempted by that which is common unto all men. And God is faithful. Who will not permit you to be tempted beyond what you can be able to stand. The boat did not just float aimlessly through the entire process. It was brought to a rock. And Paul finishes by saying, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape so that you may be able to stand. It is dark, but it makes sense. It makes sense for three reasons. Reason number one is divine denials have excluded from me the things that would sabotage my experience in the darkness. It makes sense because divine denials have excluded from my experience the things that would sabotage my survival. Yeah, I know you hated it, going to that Christian school. You felt restricted by it. But now you look back and you realize the restrictions of then have ensured you survive now. Reason number two, it is dark, but it makes sense because the waters will not be there forever. The Bible says the windows of heaven were stopped. The fountains of the deep were closed. The rain ceased. It is not always going to pelt with rain. And God is doing this because he remembers the frame of the boat. He knows it is wood. He knows it will not take rain forever. So it is dark now, yes, but it makes sense because there is divine limitation. He has said it will come this far and it will not continue any farther. Friends, remember, when you're going through that dark period, God has already remembered and counted the strength of your ark, and he will not allow a single day of rain more to come upon you. He remembers our frame. He knows we are dust. It is dark, but it makes sense. Because we are not in the hands of fate but we're in the hands of an extremely loving God who will create divine limitations. He will tell the temptations, you can come this far, but not any farther. You can run this number of days, but not a day more, not a day less, because I know what I have fashioned within my child. I know what I've been fabricating in him during the times of divine delay. I have remembered him. I have remembered that. And you will not come any step more because there's divine limitation. It is dark, but it makes sense, number three, because God will provide a rock to stabilize us. He'll provide a resting place so that we will have a way to escape the endless tossing and turning. Now, it is one thing for God to provide a way of escape. It is another thing for us to allow ourselves to access and enjoy that escape. Some of us have become so familiar with the hustle, that when God provides a way out of the hustle, we still are not yet prepared. Some of us are so infatuated with our sin that when God provides a way to escape the sin, we are just not ready because we love the sin more than the Savior. But for every child of God going through a dark season, the rock will be provided. It may be in the form of that friend who just comes and is there. 
They may not know all the right theology. They may not quote all the right verses. They may not sing the songs with the right tunes, but they are there. That may be your way of escape. Your way of escape at times may be being fired because God knows that that workspace you have is tempting you in more ways than one. And whereas you're gaining a salary, you're also acquiring your way to destruction. So God's ways of escape at times are weird. But when we quantify eternity versus the things we are struggling with here, Ellen White reminds us heaven will be cheap enough. I thought of a way to finish this. And I wanted to remind you that that rock, his name is Jesus. That rock, his name is Jesus. You see, in, 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 in all other faith traditions, the answer to the question of pain and darkness is theories, is ideas. It is only in the Christian tradition where the answer to the question of pain is a person. Because God so loved the world he gave us, his son, Christ is acquainted with our pain, not as a concept. He's acquainted with our darkness, not as a theory. He hung on a cross one dark afternoon 2,000 years ago and as a result of that, Paul reminds us he is able to succor us because he was tempted as we are. And therefore he resonates with us. In the hours of darkness, the child of God does not have theory to lean on. He has a person to depend upon. Please notice this picture it with me. The ark is coming down. Imagine the mountain as a person bowing down so that the ark will not be buffeted by the storm endlessly, but will rest upon the mountain. That's what Christ does for us. He knows my child has gone through divine denials. My child is experiencing divine limitations and he bows in and he provides divine support. It is dark, but it makes sense. And I pray as we go through the journey of life today, as we desire God to fill our cups, the dark seasons are surprisingly times God uses to fill our cups through divine denials, divine limitations, and divine support. Sovereign Lord, Thank you for the winds. Thank you for the waters. And thank you for the mountain. Thank you for the things you have denied us. It hurts. It doesn't make sense when we are going through it. But now we see, alas, why you did it. Thank you for divine limitations. Because, Lord, we are reminded we are not just tossing around, dictated by fate but we are regulated by you. But thank you, Lord, for divine support. Because we don't have theory to depend on, we have a person to lean on. May these three things, in our hours of respective darkness, help us make sense of our experience so that we do not lose faith, sweet consolation offered us in your holy word. And just lingering a minute longer, Lord, in prayer, thank you for the prophetic implications of this. That even the wind's prophecy tells us you can still use us and you can still use them for our good. The waters of people in the end time, thank you because, Lord, they will not have the final say you will. And living God, when the world will come against us, we are reminded we have a rock to depend upon, and that rock is Jesus. So for now, and for the times prophecy points us to, help us tap in into divine limitations, divine denials, and to leverage divine support. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.